will now move on to the first session where we'll discuss how ICT is bringing growth in India. Can we have the AV, please? जिस तरह क्वालिटी एजुकेशन हर इंसान की जिंदगी बदल देती है उसी तरह इंफॉर्मेशन एंड कम्युनिकेशन टेक्नोलॉजी आई ने एजुकेशन सिस्टम को पॉजिटिवली और डीपली चेंज कर दिया है इस डिजिटल एरा में महज एक क्लिक में स्टूडेंट्स को क्वालिटी एजुकेशन मिल रही है वर्ल्ड क्लास पेडोलॉजी के जरिए पढ़ने सीखने और करियर के बेहतर ऑप्शन मिल रहे हैं आई के बढ़ते इस्तेमाल ऐसी इंडियन एजुकेशन सेक्टर बदलाव के साथ आगे बढ़ रहा है Have a discussion on this topic. I would like to request my colleague Aditi Tyagi to please come on stage. Now I request our panelists to please come on stage. First, we have Dr. Ajay Patnish, Deputy Director and Chief Academic Officer, Thapar University. तैयार हो खाना नहीं खाए तुसी? खाना नहीं खाए मुझे मजा नहीं आ रहा मैं दिल्ली से आई हूं तालियों में इतनी कंजूसी क्यों प्लीज यूज राउंड ऑफ अप्लॉज फॉर आर गेस्ट थैंक यू थैंक यू सो मच एंड आई प्रॉमिस यू आई वोट लेट यू गेट बोर्ड वी आर गोइंग टू प्ले टी ट्वेंटी 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 क्रिकेट राइट You must be getting matches uh, in Chandigarh also, Mohali. I must say, and uh, I promise you, I'll try to speak and ask questions that you would have in your mind. So I'm going to start the session, and uh, as you saw in the AV, uh, how ICT is bringing growth in India. Doctor Saab, I'll begin with you. And uh, when I was looking at uh, your LinkedIn profile, I saw that uh, you are an institution yourself. Uh, in an age where people like to make changes pretty fast especially when it comes to workplace you have been at one institution for close to 25 years so loyalty commitment how have you kept it going and uh, how much do you think icity has played uh, a role in this uh, journey of yours thank you thank you very much yeah yeah it's working okay Uh, hold the mic closer thank you for having me here uh, i have been at uh, thapar since 1999 as you rightly captured and very humbled by uh, the kind words you spoke about me uh, if i look back for last 25 years like i'll just compl i possibly complete this next two months yeah a silver jubilee a silver jubilee at <laughs> thapar institute right so that huge round of applause please please guys kanjusi nahi taaliyon mein kanjusi nahi right so uh, when i look back you know to the times when i was a student at thapar institute in mid 80s and then 10 years in industry and then 1999 onwards in the university uh, i would remember that the first 10 years say, from 1999 to say 2000 were exactly similar to what used to happen in my time as a student things started to change for us at least in thapar institute Uh, i would say 2013 onwards right until that point in time uh, like everybody else in india we were more content driven textbookish right so every the whole education paradigm was that you have a prescribed syllabus right and students would remember formulas they will go and write an exam possibly do very well but the education was a uh, very prescriptive so what would happen generally was that students would after the they uh, write the exam they will forget in a few weeks or a few months uh, what's going on when in 2013 14 is a time when we started to move away from content driven education to more ict based and i would at least at that point in time add also that we started to move in the direction of outcome based education in a project led education in uh, entrepreneurial uh, education self directed learning uh, research inspired right thapar institute has got almost about 700 faculty mm -hmm. and 
almost many of our last majority of them are very research active. So we encourage all of them to take their research to the classrooms and uh, encourage the students and, you know, towards innovation, right? So that's a small change we started to build in 2013, 14 onwards. Uh, I would say today very proudly of last 10 years of how we have handled this is that uh, all our programs that we offer today are outcome based. Now that's not merely a word because we built in minor projects, major projects, capstone projects into almost the entire curriculum that we offer. Now of course of late in the last two or three years AI has become such a such a big buzzword all around. So we have also taken a very major step in this direction. We are in the right now in the process of signing up with, signing up with NVIDIA. Okay. Right? NVIDIA is the largest uh, you know, uh, GPU manufacturing company mm -hmm. in the world. And last month, myself, our chairman, director, and of Professor Maninder Singh, we visited NVIDIA headquarters. They also uh, facilitated a visit to University of Florida mm -hmm. and SMU in Dallas, where they have set up what is called as an AI institute, right? What we are now trying to do over the next, when I say what's going to happen, going to happen in the future is that we make everyone AI literate on uh, our campus. Okay. The idea here is that AI is not only just a tech program. Mm -hmm. AI is going to be added to every course that we offer, mm -hmm. uh, every program that we offer, be it liberal arts, be it management, be it all engineering mm -hmm. programs, psychology, mm -hmm. and whatever, because the today's jobs are all driven by AI. Look at health center, health mm -hmm. services, look at weather. Look, I was, you know, when I was in the University of Florida, the data center had told us, mm -hmm. you know, that they, they, they tried to see that there's 2,800 movies of two hours each. Mm -hmm. If you want to have to watch it, like it will take you one year. Even if you watch them at a one and a half times the speed, mm. it will still take you six months to watch them. And then, and then probably the question of how long would you take to process that as Right, well. and then you Human need to mind. process it. Now yeah. look at the DG sets that we now we are buying, you know, those, the NVIDIA supercomputers that we are buying. They will do that job in one second, that kind of an equipment, okay. right? Now look at the weather stations today. If you keep collecting the data we used to do it in the past, it will take you weeks to process the data. Okay. We have to work on a weather situation on like an or on an immediate basis, right? Mm -hmm. So AI is something which is going to majorly impact our lives uh, and all the jobs, be whichever, it's not only tech, every job it will impact. So we have taken this step. We are subject to, of course, regulatory clearances, yeah. are going to offer a AI and uh, machine learning program starting this year full time, and with a major investment from NVIDIA into the skills development at Thapar Institute, this is the direction that we have taken. So I can now look back with a lot of pride at the last 10 years, this has been a very major breakthrough for us in, the, in terms of how, we, how, how pedagogical inputs we have made into our sure. curriculum. Right. Thank you. Sure. sure. Professor Saab. Prime Minister Modi has been harping on the fact that India would be the third largest economy in next five years. He, he says that probably in next three years. But my question to you would be, how much would education sector contribute to that, and how huge a role would be played by ICT towards that? I will thank you for this opportunity. And yes, uh, uh, will uh, our Pradhan Mantri ji has also stated that we are looking at the Viksit Bharat mm -hmm. in 2047. Well, I want you to ponder over the first part as well, that today we are the fifth largest economy of the world. Absolutely. Militarily, we are at number four, third largest budget of the world, 14 lakh strong army. Space exploration, we have shown through Chandrayaan that we are the real boss. COVID-19, it tested us and we came out with flying colors. And still we believe that we are not a superpower. So what else is required in this case? Well, I believe what you stated, that uh, we need to be economically strong still further. And in that, in the whole lot of list, if I describe, I find that education is at number one. And then education, what kind of education? Not the kind of education that we have been having during the last 50, 60 years. Though, of course, 
from the traditional knowledge base, we have come on to the skill base and we are moving still further. But then this needs to be disseminated faster at a rate faster than ever before. And during our testing time in COVID-19, it was made amply clear that yes, we are in a position to do that. Our level was 4x. So ICT played a tremendous role in disseminating this information, this knowledge and the available technologies. So I believe technology and especially ICT, this is going to be the base through which India will be headed towards a superpower. Because that's how we are, we are going to make everybody educated. And the benefits of whatever we have, mainly the education, they will be reaching the largest population. And Antodai, the person living in the last row, once he is given these benefits, then only we can think of becoming the real superpower. See, in general, you would agree with me that the kind of uh, jobs or the services or uh, the resources that we have, say if you put them as primary, secondary, tertiary, primary, those, those which are concerned with the agricultural part, the mining part, the water resources, the natural resources. Then number two, we have the industry. There, or say the third one comes where you have services, consultancy. The third one is making the largest use of this technology, ICT, be the information for making decisions or be it the communication and the technology of all sorts. Second one, yes, it has been able to draw the next best out of the ICT. CAD, CAM, machines, everything we are having. But the first one where still I believe 70% of the country is based, the agriculture part, the natural resources, there, we have not been able to reach up to the last person. So that's where I believe we need to target. And that's precisely my question to Dr. Saab, to you, as uh, Sir has spoken in greater detail about how we need to manage Antyo there. So somebody who's watching this broadcast, sitting in a remote village, and he's not or she is not techno savvy. Like, for example, yes, technology exists, it comes with its own advantages, but then at the same time, people have certain perception about it. Some people are tech savvy, some aren't uh, that tech friendly. So when it comes to the education sector, that last person that Professor Baldev Setia was talking about, how would you convince him or her to take this up, to, you know, tune, attune the mindset? and become more tech-friendly and take up such programs. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. Thank yeah, you, sir, for joining I'll say you. that uh, uh, for uh, uh, the digital literacy, yeah. the boost has been from the government of India. There have been, uh, uh, in uh, 2015, more than 15,000 crores have been uh, put for educating people about digital literacy. So the government uh, initiatives, coupled with the initiative of uh, uh, your, you can say, some industries and from educational institutions, we are going for digital literacy. And I think uh, uh, it will definitely take some time. But as you see, then it was the pandemic time. Over the night, every education institute become digital institution. So you can see, when there is an urge, and there is a need, and there is a market, and there are, there are all government uh, assistance. I think uh, it is going to happen. And uh, uh, you can see, uh, as on date, all higher education institutions, they are into this, and they are also contributing for digital literacy. And uh, maybe now the next step can be that uh, we can have uh, these uh, uh, skill in India, other kind of programs which uh, go deep into the roots of Indian, uh, 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 you can say, villages or rural India, and they can educate the people in uh, digital literacy. So that, that's uh, what we can think of. So, Dr. Saab, just building on what uh, Dr. Lalit K. Avasti has just said, and the, the idea that I was talking about, where some can be very tech-friendly uh, and some can be averse to it, 
uh, when you talk about the ecosystem, and sir did talk about the ecosystem, how the government has been helping, how there have been innovations. I will come to the cost part from where the money would be coming to this. But doesn't this require a mindset change? Because when I talk to people, especially, uh, I'm not trying to stereotype, but won't you feel, won't, don't you think that there are certain challenges that exist in the rural markets? Does because uh, of course there are infrastructural issues, right? So in the rural areas, you will have connectivity issues, things of those kinds. But I will also like to give you an example here again from my own, uh, you know, experiences at Thapar. We run a project called Digital Villages, right? Now the Digital Villages projects is of course done in, of course, in the field. We do, we do a lot of work uh, in the labs, but there's also a lot of work done in the fields with the farmers, with people in the rural areas, right? Now, what exactly is being done is that, you know, uh, one of my colleagues uh, who's the PI of the project, and we also have a PI in abroad in a different university. He's sitting here right now in this. Uh, in this. So what they, they have been uh, uh, trying to do uh, in this case is uh, they have been trying to use sensors. They have been trying to educate the farmers to use those sensors to pick up information on the crop. Mm -hmm. I went with them to one of these field studies because we adopted 10 villages near Patiala uh, uh, last year, right? And what we did was that they deployed drip, drip, drip irrigation, irrigation system in, in some fields and traditional flood irrigation in, in different fields. And we co-opted the farmers on the field, right? None of them knew how to use those sensors, which actually went into the crop. None of them knew how to use the mm -hmm. drones that we actually had put in to capture the crop data and everything. But as soon as we actually made this, uh, you know, infrastructure available to them, the usage was enormous. They just grabbed it with both hands. So what I'm trying to say here is from this example is that once the infrastructure reaches these rural areas, the technology will immediately be taken in by all. Right now, our... But has it? Hmm? Has it reached these it remote hasn't, areas? Right? Some of the... Uh, what my understanding is, those who have close access to the urban centers, mm -hmm. there it has definitely reached. But areas which are deeper inside, which are, mm -hmm. which are quite far away from the mm -hmm. urban centers, there it will take, still take, take some time. Mm -hmm. As Sir, uh, Professor Avasti mentioned, mm -hmm. COVID was kind of... You know, for the blessing in disguise, right? For yeah. at least for the IT, ICT part of it, right? Overnight, something which would have possibly taken us a decade to do, it happened in two years, right? Everybody became tech savvy. I remember, uh, you know, school teachers who had never used any ICT tools before, suddenly they were teaching cl classes over Zoom or something or other platforms, mm -hmm. right? They all became tech savvy. Little children sitting in front of computers and trying to attend classes, games. So all this was actually, you know, accelerated by COVID, right? There were a lot of problems with COVID, mm -hmm. but this one was, I would say, was a kind of a advantage which we got mm -hmm. from ICT. So what I'm trying to say here is, rural areas still would need infrastructure, bandwidths, all the, you know, uh, you know everything that is needed to uh, make it ICT ready. We are not yet there, sure. but I think we are on way to get there. Uh, Professor Saab, uh, when I was working at UNESCO headquarters in Paris, they used to talk about ICT competence for teachers framework. And the whole idea was democratization of education, especially in the African continent. If I try to ask you a question about how much it has been implemented on the ground and what sort of changes do you, can one say that uh, education now in India is more democratized as uh, as it was in the past, Pardon? as more? compared to the past? Is it more democratized? Oh, certainly. Education now, I would say, is fully democratized. But look at the teeming millions that we have. Reaching out to people, well, now I'll change the stance a little and uh, put a question before everybody. With or without ICT, if I look, at, look back at the last 50 years, our problems have still remained the same. Hunger, mm -hmm. unemployment, climate change, we need cl clean environment, we need energy. So all those have still remained the same. What is it that we are trying to do now is, yes, now we are trying to educate more and more people and dissemination through the ICT tools. 
this can help us and in fact this is one big mode how education can be democratized so yes i mean i, I don't find any doubt in that okay. that it is not democratized in india at least the kind of policies that we have education for all yes the difficulties could be at different levels but then so far as the facilities look at even the higher education which not many countries in the world have we have perhaps the largest and the cheapest most economical setup for higher education no country in the world provides higher education and technical education at such cheap prices and that's what i believe is democratization the biggest step towards democratization Dr. Lalit Kiyawasti, this is my last question for the session, and uh, I would like to ask you about the challenges ahead, and uh, uh, what sort of help would you expect from the government or other stakeholders to improve the situation? Because uh, if we read about EdTech, they say the bubble has busted, there are challenges ahead. So how can those challenges be tackled? Uh, definitely the uh, government policies, the uh, people expectations, there, there is a gap. But uh, you can see uh, the uh, kind of ICT tools we have, majorly we can say the mobile, uh, the smartphone, it has come to be very common now. And this has become one of the uh, tools to educate people, whether it is farmer, whether it is a person, uh, a student, or, or any other uh, sector. So you can see challenges are there, we need to reach so bandwidth and other things, but all these aspects, the bandwidth on one side, the computing devices the, on the other side, the ICT tools on the other side, and maybe sensor technology, what not, every, every technology, those technologies we are advancing, but maybe little bit we need to do it at a faster pace. Maybe we need to put more uh, uh, efforts on how we integrate all of them and make it usable to the common man, maybe to the... Uh, to a, a farmer in the uh, fields, isn't it? Exactly. Uh, the, uh, the example which has been given that uh, farmers are using uh, the sensors and all those things. Those needs to be done with them and it is the, uh, I think if, if it has to change, it is the educational institutions which have come to for and they need to deliberate and they need to come to the uh, grassroots, they need to come uh, go to the villages and educate. I think uh, this is the uh, biggest education uh, setup of India. It is going to change this uh, landscape altogether. Maybe Thapar uh, Pak or Sardar Patel University or any other institution. Maybe the school uh, teachers or educators, they, they need to deliver. Whosoever is uh, educated, they need to educate more. Uh, well, sir, excuse then, me, if you yeah. allow me to add. See, if you look at the ground, Basically, the government policies, there are only two ways how we accept this kind of technology. Either there is a pull, I like something, yeah. and I would like to see that. I can even watch the kind of plays which are available in some other language, which I don't understand. And then there is push. See, look at the e-disha, e-mitra, the registration of your land records, everything. Now, is that, I mean, what else does the government come forward to do? I believe... We have not seen the use of technology better than ever before with these kind of uh, facilities and help reaching out to the common man. It's a, it's a big tool and it is reaching out to people in India. And that is what anyone sitting in this room would want. Thank you so much, gentlemen. I really enjoyed this session. I hope you guys also felt the same way. Please, huge round of applause for these gentlemen. Thank you so much. And it's over to you, sir. Thank you so much all for the valuable insight. Please stay on the stage. Now I would like to invite Mr. Jagmeet Jammu, Regional Head, News 18 Punjab, Haryana, JKLS to please come on stage to felicitate our honorable guests. First we have Dr. Ajay Bhatish, Deputy Director and Chief Academic Officer, Thapar University. Thank 
अवस्थी वाइस चांसलर सरदार पटेल यूनिवर्सिटी